Awesome, thanks. Um, so uh, I've been invited to share uh, our compliance statistics from our last completed um, fiscal year, which was the 2018 to 2019 year. I'm going to start with a quick overview of, uh, of the inspection program in general, and then I'm going to share the findings specifically for the ag source materials um, side of the inspection program. And then my colleague Lisa Ross, who's going to join us in just a few minutes here, is uh, the program specialist for the NASM side of our agriculture program, and she'll share the inspection findings for, uh, for the NASM work. And, and then together we're going to, uh, to talk a little bit about a, a, a new pilot, a new ag inspection process that we've begun piloting during this current fiscal year. Um, so uh, a couple of general points that I want to start with that apply to all of our agricultural inspections, whether they're focused on the ASM or the NASM side of things. Um, all of those inspections are conducted by our agricultural environmental officers. We have 16 of them who are positioned across the province. Uh, and the Nutrient Management Act tends to be the principal regulatory framework, the principal focus of those inspections. But our agricultural environmental officers are also designated under our Environmental Protection Act, the Ontario Water Resources Act, the Pesticides Act. And so there are always some um, general provisions, things like the prohibition from discharging a contaminant to the environment causing an adverse effect or uh, d discharges that uh, may impair water quality. Um, while those pieces of legislation uh, tend to be a secondary focus um, of our historical ag inspections, uh, they are still a part of it, um, which is a very long-winded way of saying we don't just look at the Nutrient Management Act when we're out there. There are some other requirements that we have an eye to as well. So for the ASM inspections then, um, there are two different types of inspections um, that I want to clarify before I move into any of the details. Um, the first is what most of you in the ASM world um, are, are probably thinking when we talk about nutrient management inspections, and those are our, our, our very typical proactive inspections. They're focused on um, in specifically the phased in farms, so those 6,500 farms that are subject to nutrient management strategies. They tend to have the strongest emphasis on assessing compliance with requirements under the Nutrient Management Act, so the things like the prescribed instruments, the strategies, the plans, um, the, uh, the, the storage requirements, and in particular for the storages that contain agricultural source materials um, and that sort of thing. And we, we scope or build those um, nutrient management inspections using a series of control points which I'll get into in a couple of slides. The other type of inspection that we do is we call it a compliance summary inspection. And in a lot of cases, this inspection type will be used as part of a, a reactive inspection. So if we're responding to a complaint or an observation that we've made when we're out into the field. Um, and, and this one, because it isn't um, as focused on the Nutrient Management Act compliance. Um, it might be applied at unfazed in farms, so those that don't require nutrient management strategies, and it tends to have more of a focus on these adverse effects or impairment, which of course are regulated under the EPA and the Ontario Water Resources Act, um, respectively. <laughs> when we're choosing sites for any of these inspections, um, we have a large pool to draw from. Um, we know from the last census for uh, for agriculture that there are about 49,000 farms in the province, 19,000 of those are livestock operations, so they're generating nutrient units. And of those, at the beginning of that 18-19 fiscal year, we knew that there were about 6,500 of them that had been phased in under the Nutrient Management Act, and 1,300 of those that were big enough, greater than 300 nutrient units, that they also required a plan. Um, we don't pick sites for inspections randomly. We have a risk-based approach. We consider a lot of different pieces of information, and we do tend to, for those proactive nutrient management inspections, we do tend to focus more on these larger ones uh, that are already subject to nutrient management strategies. Some of the different risk factors that we will consider when we're trying to choose even um, a couple of hundred inspection targets for a given year out of that 
bucket of 6,500 sites are things like how many nutrient units are being generated there. Are they generated in liquid versus solid manure? What is the ratio to nutrient units versus the tillable acres that are in their declared farm unit? How many days of storage have they uh, identified in their strategy? Whether or not they're located, and this is a, a particularly strong risk factor that we've been focusing on in recent years, but whether or not they're located within a, uh, an area where um, nutrient management activities have been identified as a significant drinking water threat in a source protection plan policy. Uh, and then their renewal status. Um, and, and this one is, is going to change a little bit over the next couple of years because, of course, uh, none of the existing active strategies are going to expire um, just because they've hit that five-year mark. Um, that cessation trigger has been removed. But we will continue um, to, uh, to, to look at those um, sites whose strategy expired before July 1st um, of 2019 um, as, as ones that appear to be out of compliance with that requirement to have an active nutrient management strategy that's in force. Some of the other factors that we'll consider in selecting sites for inspection um, are their inspection or compliance history, uh, any field observations that we might make when we're out, our agricultural environmental officers are out driving around their districts, and any complaints that we might receive uh, from the public. Um, once we've selected a site to inspect, we also take a risk-based approach to scoping the different things that we're going to look at. And we tend to try to look at the, uh, the, the nutrient management systems and components um, that, are, that have the highest likelihood of impacting the environment. Um, we have a series of 21 different control points, uh, and the inspections become very modular in the sense that I could go out and um, look at two different liquid storages on the site, and I would apply a liquid storages control point to each of those. I might also take a look at their nutrient management strategy, and I would apply that control point. And we'll build an inspection by adding a series of control points, one each to assess compliance with the different components um, or instruments that are a part of that site um, that we think have the highest risk or potential to, uh, to impact the environment. The control points themselves have um, three different sections of questions. Um, there's a series of initial assessment questions that are there to identify the risks to human health and the environment. Um, then there's a further set of risk management questions that are used to determine whether or not those risks exist for the site. Um, and then there's always a series of compliance questions as well um, that sort of follow up on, uh, on the risks. Um, the inspections that we conducted then within the 2018-19 fiscal year, um, we did 161 inspections across the province. 132 of those fit within that um, more comprehensive nutrient management inspections, so the ones that focus uh, on the phased-in farms, and then 29 of the compliance summary inspections uh, that may have included some unphased-in farms. Um, the scope of all of those specifically 132 nutrient management ones. This is the breakdown, um, and I apologize for the small print here, but of the different control points. So we did a lot of uh, inspections of solid and liquid storages, um, a lot of inspections that included um, an assessment of the nutrient management strategies, uh, a fair number of ones that uh, touched on dead stock, uh, field application, outdoor confinement areas. Um, it, it, that's how they break down. Uh, but as I said, we, we tend to try to choose the control points to assess the components and activities that we view as having the highest potential to cause an impact on human health or the environment. Um, some highlights then from, from um, all of those 502 control points that we did this year. Some areas where we saw a particularly high rate of compliance, so a really good job. Um, a particularly high rate of compliance with the sign-off form being completed along with the strategies and plans. Um, really good compliance where we evaluated field application looking at the setbacks from wells. Uh, really good compliance with the free board requirements for liquid storages. Uh, really good compliance with uh, managing upslope water from solid storages and, uh, and, and removing tiles within 15 meters of those permanent solid storages um, and, uh, and, and, and decent compliance with restricting access to surface water for uh, livestock and outdoor confinement areas. Some of the um, specific 
items where we identified a higher rate of non-compliance. We continue to see, as Matt pointed out earlier, a particularly high rate of non-compliance with completing that annual review and update. And now that the five-year cessation trigger has been removed from strategies, I think in particular this is one that we're um, hoping to see a lot of improvement and, uh, and, and as operators are driven towards that uh, new template that Matt pointed out on the nutrientmanagement.ca website, will hopefully make it easier for folks to understand uh, what needs to be included in that annual review and update and a really easy template that they can follow um, to do it that will start to see the compliance rate for this one increase. Uh, in terms of field application, um, following uh, what's actually in the nutrient management plan. We've uh, seen a higher rate of non-compliance. Um, the uh, annual updates, uh, again, absent vegetated buffer zones where they are required um, for fields that are subject to plans. Um, the application methods use near surface water for storages, both liquid and solid. Um, we saw this past fiscal year um, some issues with the construction not matching the engineering design that was prepared ahead of that. Um, and uh, absent site characterization studies, so that geotech investigation that has to be done ahead of construction of some permanent storages. Uh, for the outdoor confinement areas, uh, some issues with, uh, with runoff management, um, and then on the dead stock management side, where we continue to see uh, higher rates of non-compliance is around uh, the record keeping. Um, so where we, in terms of the non-compliance that we do see, um, we, we, we categorize our inspections as ones being in compliance, so where we did not identify any violations, uh, and then this uh, second pie slice are the, uh, what we would consider minor administrative non-compliances, things like um, absent dead stock record keeping, missing annual reviews and updates, the types of administrative requirements that do not have a direct impact on human health and the environment, um, and then moving into the uh, minor and major um, non-compliance, um, so beyond the paperwork type violations. These would be things like um, missing uh, runoff management, uh, missing vegetated buffers, uh, and then this significant non-compliance would be things like um, I built a storage and not in accordance with my engineered um, construction requirements, I didn't do a geophysical investigation, and there were drainage towels sticking out of the side of my new lagoon. Um, that sort of thing. Um, looking at, so this is the same information here for the 2018-19 fiscal year. Year over year, we're not seeing a big change. Um, we're, we're still seeing mostly um, in compliance or in compliance with minor administrative violations. This is very good year over year to see these first two columns so high. Um, and, and we're not seeing much of a change in terms of um, the amount of other non-compliance issues. Um, this slide, I, I, I really like this one. Um, I, it's meant to highlight where we do come across violations of any kind. What are the kinds of tools that we're using to bring the farms into compliance? And far and away, um, voluntary abatement um, seems to be the most, the only tool that's required. Um, so uh, w without having to use provincial officers orders or part one summons, that sort of thing. 96% um, of the time we're able to address all of those various issues, administrative and otherwise, using voluntary abatement tools. The Ag program is very much, we're there to support and promote compliance. We're not out there trying to um, catch people doing a bad thing and um, nail them to the wall. It's, it, it's about supporting you and getting you into compliance. Um, some general observations, a few things, and maybe I'll start with this general impression. Um, most of what we're seeing is administrative in nature, um, and, uh, in, and in particular, and I want to kind of highlight this one again, is, uh, is issues around that annual review and update, which I think is um, that much more important that we're following it moving forward now that the five-year cessation trigger for the strategies has been removed. Um, some of the other things that we're coming across, the violations that um, I see as, as, as having an increased potential to um, impact human health and the environment, so the more higher 
risk violations um, are uh, things like uh, that example that I shared about missing engineer certificate and geophysical investigation for the new storages, uh, missing vegetated buffers where they're required, um, accepting material that isn't an ag source material into um, manure lagoons, um, and then land applying it as if it were ASM um, when it's not. Uh, and, and in particular, the issue that we run into with that one is, uh, is the increased odors um, and the impacts that that can have on neighbors. Uh, and then always in, um, around winter spreading, um, I, I think that there remains a lot of confusion out there around when winter spreading um, is allowed subject to conditions, when it isn't allowed, uh, when it's absolutely legal to do it but maybe not a good best management practice um, we'd love to see less of that happening I think in general and uh, and I know we have a speaker uh, after the break to talk about the timing matters campaign and I think that that's a really important piece in driving some improvement there hi folks uh, my name is Lisa Ross I uh, work with Nathan very closely in our Southwest regional office in London I am the uh, divisional program specialist for the NASM um, program uh, NASM non being non agricultural source materials and I also deal with um, the regulation of various biosolid application activities that occur in non agricultural settings and I also work with the hauled sewage program today I'm just going to quick fair, uh, speak fairly briefly about um, uh, basically I'm mirroring uh, Nathan's uh, presentation but I'll talk about the NASM side of the picture so looking at the outcomes of our program in fiscal year 1819 so in the NASM uh, side of the uh, ledger, we do two different types of inspections. And um, Nathan mentioned in, in the sort of the more general um, nutrient management, he's got 27 control points, something along those lines. Um, with us in the NASM program, there's just two inspections and each have a single control point. And, and all a control point is, just to put that into English, it's just a series of questions that are, that are targeted to a particular activity. Um, and they, as Nathan mentioned, they'll deal with some, some questions that are more linked to risk and then others that are very specifically talking about legal requirements. So in the NASM program, we have what we call a NASM site assessment inspection and we have a, what's called a NASM land application inspection. The site assessment inspection really focuses on the NASM plan itself that's been prepared by a NASM plan developer. And in particular, we, we uh, pay a fair bit of attention to looking at the sketch uh, that goes with the NASM plan as well as uh, other elements of the NASM plan. The land application inspection, as the uh, term might suggest, is really focusing on um, the land application activity that is very often being undertaken by um, uh, a consultant, a, a PMAB, or a uh, licensed nutrient application technician. Sometimes we'll do both those sides of the coin uh, at a single site. Um, so we'll do look at both the NASM plan and look at the land application activities. More often we look at one or the other. So the NASM site assessment in particular is a proactive inspection where we're selecting certain NASM plans just to assess um, the quality of that plan. And then with the land application inspections, typically we're getting a notification from a NASM plan, uh, sorry, from a, a, a PMAB, uh, prescribed materials application business, um, telling us we plan on going out and doing a NASM la land application next week and our field staff will go out um, to take a look at that application activity uh, when it's going on. So that's the, the general approach we take. Like the um, Nathan side of the program, we do try and incorporate risk as much as we can into the selection of, of what sites should we take a look at. In particular on the, the um, uh, site assessment side, when we're picking the NASM plans that we uh, want to do an inspection on, we look at a number of factors, including is there a storage, is it a higher risk material in terms of odor, is there um, surface water adjacent to or running through fields. We're looking for sites with uh, relatively um, uh, shallower depths to bedrock because there are higher risk sites. Certain soil types, the A profile is a higher risk site. Uh, we look at source protection information, and then we also will sometimes look at, at local considerations, we call it, that, that our district staff would know, you know, there's a particular site, uh, we've had complaints, or there may be cases where, where we've had some issues uh, or concerns um, with a particular um, uh, consultant or company at some point, so I want to revisit um, and assess compliance. So there's a lot of factors that can go into site selection. So in fiscal year 1819, we did um, across the province 51 um, of these NASM site assessment inspections. So these are the ones looking at the plan itself. And um, we do uh, inspections all across the province. Um, 
but not so much in the north. There just isn't a whole lot of NASM um, in the north, and we did not have a whole lot of staff uh, capacity in the north. So um, we didn't do any NASM site assessments uh, in that fiscal year in the northern region. When you look at compliance rates, and Nathan gave an explanation, um, uh, let me see if I can go high tech here. Uh, so over half the sites were in, in what we would call um, you know, full compliance. We did not identify any issues of non-compliance. In about 20% of the cases with our, our site assessments, there was what we'd call a minor administrative non-compliance. So that, that could be things like um, uh, you know, a relatively minor piece of information was missing or inaccurate in the plan. The other type that um, we would see with, um, uh, with the NASM plans we call significant non-compliance minor, and it's a funny distinction we make, but, but those are cases where, and, and that is pretty much always the case with the site assessment um, inspections, nothing has happened bad in the environment because I'm just looking at your plan, but something is missing. Um, and it's typically something that the field officer is flagging as a more, consi uh, more significant miss um, that, that does have potential to uh, introduce, um, uh, increases the probability of running into problems when the actual NAN NASM land application uh, takes place. Looking at year over year um, uh, compliance, I'm sorry this, this graph is a little bit small, but there's never been clear trends that I have seen since I've been involved with the NASM plan. It's always a little up and uh, down. Um, looking over the last several years, the rates of full compliance range from as low as 30% to as high as, as over 60%. Um, the good news is we don't, we almost never see what we call significant non, major non-compliances. Um, but we do, we do see a certain rate of, of, of issues missing um, or concerns with the, um, with the plans themselves. So when we look at that control point document, which I mentioned is a, a series of very specific questions, um, we like to look and, and see if there is trends. Is there anything in particular that's being missed? Or is it a whole bunch of different things? Um, and, and generally speaking, it's a good news story. For most of the specific legal requirements, we're seeing over 90% of the inspections are showing that we've got good compliance. The sorts of issues that, um, uh, that tend to be missed in the um, preparation of the NASM plans themselves, and this is the uh, consistent finding year after year after year, is the identification of surface water um, that's within 150 meters of the, um, of the proposed spreading area. And missing of wells, particularly off-site wells are tough. Um, and, um, and showing that uh, it's, it's there's also a fairly consistent trend where there's difficulty finding dug wells or other wells. Um, uh, we do a better job or we see better, better results with, um, with drilled wells. There's also some issues with uh, misidentifying slope and um, uh, not properly identifying separation distances. The one thing that does catch my attention, because I'm looking at the broader program view, is where we do come across legal non-compliances about half the time it's a repeat. So if we look at the same um, developer, we're seeing similar issues um, across m uh, more than one NASM plan. Uh, we also look at best management practices and the rates of conformance with best management practices are fairly variable. The one that is relatively low fairly consistently is we don't see a lot of NASM plans showing where soil samples have been taken. Now that's not a legal requirement, but it is a BMP and we'd love to see that added. In terms of the approach we take where we do run into a non-compliance, it's quite a similar um, approach as Nathan mentioned. Um, we still, as a ministry in general, when dealing with the ag um, program, we, we really prefer a voluntary type of approach. So if we identify where our officers identify non-compliance, they will advise the farmer or the consultant and, and ask them to address it. And if you look at our, um, we had 51 uh, inspections, NASM site assessments, 20 of them had a violation. Um, some of them had multiple violations, so there were 36 violations in total, and in 34 of the 36 cases, we basically asked nicely and said, could you please address this um, violation, and almost always we get a positive uh, result. So 32 out of the 34 issues were already resolved, and two were pending uh, resolution, so something was taking a little bit longer term, but the uh, field officer was satisfied with the progress being made. In one case, we took um, what is for us a fairly unconventional approach, which is uh, more of a mandatory abatement approach where we may make a referral to our investigator group to consider a prosecution. 
but that again is not um, that's not a path our field staff will go down unless there's quite a significant um, issue or they're seeing um, I've asked nicely and we're not um, seeing progress on the land application side uh, we did 71 inspections in fiscal year 1819 again you'll see not much in the north um, otherwise we we um, we got out across the province Looking at application or, uh, compliance rates, it's a relatively good news story, as it usually is with the land application side of things. We had over 70% um, issue uh, inspections showed no issues of non-compliance. Um, we had uh, administrative non-compliance in about 16% uh, and 11%. We had um, um, some kind of, of what we would call significant non-compliance, but minor, meaning. Um, what would be a minor, something like uh, NASM was land applied within a uh, mandatory setback, say to surface water or a well, but we didn't actually see impairment. That would be the kind of thing that might be picked up. Uh, again, looking at trends, uh, the trends is a, quite a bit of good news story. Rate of compliance generally is between 60 and 70 percent or better. Um, and m for the most part, when we do come across non-compliance, it is more of the either administrative issues or it's what we would call significant non-compliance minor. So it's, we, it, it, it's, it's something that presents real risk, but there hasn't been impairment going um, associated with it typically. So again, if we look at the control point highlights, so the very detailed questions that are asked as part of every NASM plan, um, our compliance rates are greater than 90% for most of the legal requirements. Again, a good news story. Um, we didn't see any particular uh, trends. The sorts of things where um, REOs were flagging um, non-compliance were things like minor spills, um, uh, issues with sampling, either sampling results missing or um, um, the sampling result indicated that there was an issue that hadn't been uh, picked up. We had um, a couple of cases where the NASM wasn't properly characterized or it didn't meet beneficial use um, standards that are set out, in the, set out in the regulation or setbacks not met. But generally, it was a primarily a good news story um, in this last fiscal year, a pretty good job overall. Uh, conformance rates with BMPs um, were variable. The, uh, the BMP we saw least often was precautions being taken to ensure that um, you've got accurate or consistent flow across the field. Looking again at our, um, out of 71 inspections, 19 of them had some sort of legal violation, a uh, total of 37 violations identified across those 19 inspections. And we did have one inspection um, where, where obviously our field officer felt there were issues. Uh, there ended up being referrals for a prosecution, the issuance of a ticket, and they, uh, a mandatory abatement approach, meaning probably an order was issued. So one of those 19 inspections, our field staff took a fairly um, strong mandatory abatement approach. And the other 18 of the 19, we, our officers took a voluntary abatement approach. And is uh, typical, we have our field officers generally have good experience when they work cooperatively um, with the consultants involved or with the farmer involved, they get good results. General observation, so this is me just looking, stepping back and looking at the NASM plan, looking at both the inspection results and also considering just the, the issues that have come up over the course of the year, um, uh, the, the issues that our staff talk about, the sorts of complaints they receive. I'd say in generally land application is done re quite well. Um, generally speaking, the consultants do a good job um, when they're out there in the field doing the land application. There's a, there is some room for improvement in the NASM plan um, plans themselves, particularly with the sketches and particularly um, with finding um, or identifying sensitive features. So it's a, uh, it, it's, it's, it sounds like an obvious thing to do, but I know as it's for NASM plan developers, it can be tricky from uh, sometimes to get out to the field when you can actually see stuff. Um, you know, the site sketches need to be based on a field visit, but if you're forced to do a NASM plan in February when there's three feet of snow on the ground, you know, of course you're going to miss stuff. So one of the, the, the things I'd like to emphasize is the importance of having good communication with the farmer. He's got to play a role in helping you identify issues, but also it certainly is preferable if you're going out in the middle of February because you've got to get this plan submitted um, and there's three feet of snow, go back before um, land application actually takes place when you can see the ground, take a look, see if you've missed any features and update your NASM plan 
uh, sketch accordingly. Um, the other issue that comes up, and, and these are more one-offs, um, but we do see when, th when things go wrong, uh, particularly if they go terribly wrong, it is most often um, got to do with uh, breakdowns in communication. So information has not gotten from the NASM plan developer to the PMAB to the NAT. Um, sorry, the, uh, the guy developing the plan to the company that, uh, or the individual that's involved with the um, land application of that material to the actual technician who's doing that material. Or there's communication lost with the farmer. <coughs> the other thing we do find, and this is, there's, there's limits to what a consultant can do, of course, but one of the things we do find is that the farmers are not always recognizing their responsibility in this whole picture. Farmers have an important role, both in helping the, the NASM plan developers and the consultants identify um, sensitive features and provide, um, provide information on, on the site itself, but they also need to provide consultants with the information about what nutrients have been land applied. In the world of NASM, and when you're preparing NASM plans, you have to account not just for the nutrients associated with the NASM, but other nutrients that have been added during that time period. So the f it's important for the consultants to ask the farmer, what about fertilizer? What about any uh, manure and other materials that may have been land applied this year or that you plan on land applying? But it's also important for the farmers to take ownership of that and recognize that they need to consider that information. Farmers also um, need to understand that if I get NASM land applied this year, when I go out next year, I need to account for those, I need to be aware that those nutrients um, you know, if I've already put on five years worth of phosphorus last year, then that limits what I can add um, to my site this year. The other um, uh, issue that has come up from time to time is we're definitely seeing um, the NASM generators. So this could be sewage treatment plants or pulp and paper facilities or other generators are not always providing the sample results in a timely manner. So that's, that's one of my issues that I'm hoping um, in my involvement with the program to do some outreach with the generators and um, remind them of their obligations uh, to provide the consultants with the data they need in a timely manner. The other thing we are seeing, and this really isn't part of the NASM file, but it, it, it falls into, um, into that bailiwick because we are getting called out to sites with some regularity these days when people are assuming it's a, it's a NASM, a sewage biosolid NASM is being land applied, it's being land applied in the winter, or it's being land applied very close to a stream, or I've got some other concern, and when our field staff get involved, it turns out it's not a NASM. What it is is a sewage biosolid fertilizer product regulated under um, Canadian uh, Fertilizers Act and regulation. And that is something, um, that's something I'm flagging as, as a concern. There's, there's, we are seeing um, both real environmental issues um, associated in some cases with these fertilizer products. We're seeing them being land applied um, uh, in close proximity to sensitive features like streams or very close proximity to things like um, uh, tile inlets, catch basins, wells. Um, we're also seeing them uh, land applied a, a great deal in the winter. There's odor and dust issues. Um, and, and we're getting um, some fairly agitated uh, members of the, uh, of the you know, general public or neighbors who are pretty ticked off. Um, at the way some of the general, uh, some of the fertilizer pellet products are being managed. So insofar as your company has anything to do with those materials, I would encourage you to remind, um, uh, remind your, your um, you know, the NASM plan developers that they have to account for those materials if they're being land applied within a NASM plan area or if they're being land applied in a, uh, a nutrient management plan area. Um, remind farmers that if NASM is being land applied this year and I've used up all of my phosphorus requirements, you shouldn't be, you know, um, uh, th that that is going to limit other fertilizer products that you can put on this field next year, whether that's a, a commercial fertilizer, a traditional commercial fertilizer, or a, um, a sewage biosolid pellet product. So we're just seeing more and more issues um, with these biosolid pellet products and we'll have to see where that goes. The other um, Thing that a uh, trend that we're starting to see in the program has to do with wood ash waste, and it's it's a it's a, a interesting and positive development. I would characterize it so far. We are seeing more and more interest in the land application of wood ash waste in forestry settings. So we're seeing it both in it, on crown forest lands, but also in private woodlots. So we're seeing a a um, 
uh, a broader interest in introducing a wider range of, um, of uh, materials being land applied in a wider range of settings. One last slide, um, and this is one that Lisa and I both are really excited to talk with this group about, uh, because we're always looking for opportunities to drive continuous improvement in the ag inspection program, and in particular where we can um, find opportunities to drive changes that improve environmental outcomes. So finding those high risks and addressing those violations um, where addressing them will reduce the risk of something bad happening um, in the environment. Um, the Ministry of the Environment, uh, Conservation and Parks is currently in the process of developing a new IT platform for documenting all of our inspection findings. Um, and what that has provided for us is an opportunity to take a look at the program diagnostics, the compliance numbers that we share with you guys year over year um, in this meeting, and, uh, and, and consider how can we, how can we take these different types of ASM and NASM inspections, um, this broad range of control points. How can we build those inspections um, into the new IT platform in a way that ensures that we are focusing our efforts appropriately on the highest risk um, components and activities that take place on all farms um, so that when we're out there doing inspections and driving change those changes are actually again having an impact and that impact being reducing the risk of something bad happening to the environment so this year we have begun to pilot a new inspection process for agricultural inspections and it's a process that applies to both ASM and NASM inspections and and the way that that works is every ag inspection under this pilot um, focuses on uh, the components of interest um, and so those are any storages containing materials that have the potential to impacts the environment or water quality uh, livestock areas dead stock areas and fields that are receiving applications of anything as a more nasm that has the potential to migrate off-site and cause um, environmental impacts or uh, impair water quality um, so the focus shifts under this pilot away from is it ASM or is it nasm and which of the two dozen control points are we going to use towards um, what are the components of interest at this site and let's go look at them as many of them as we can and are we seeing any indication of a negative environmental outcome an elevated risk or a violation in respect of those components of interest that we can address to reduce the risk um, or support bringing uh, farms into compliance um, at, at this point it is very much in the pilot stage uh, next year I expect that what we're going to share with you guys in terms of the numbers and the inspection findings is going to start to look a little bit different and as the pilot progresses and that new IT platform is launched um, all of MECP's inspection reports not just for ag but across all of our program areas are going to begin to look a little different so for those of you who might work with your clients um, when they are receiving inspection reports uh, just to be aware that in in the next year or so they're going to start to look a little bit different um, because of the new IT platform and also because we're trying to improve the scope of our agricultural inspections as a whole to make sure that we're really hitting home on identifying and addressing those uh, components and activities that pose the greatest risk. Do you want to add anything? Nope. No. Uh, are there any questions? Ben? Oh, I have. Sorry, I have a question that came in off the webinar. I'll start with. Sure. Where'd that go? How do ministry inspectors determine which inspection form to use? That is the control points versus new approach when they conduct an inspection. So the program, Lisa and I, provides them with guidance um, on, on how to, to scope their individual inspection. But of course, they also have discretion. And they're there on the ground uh, with the farmer or the NASM plan developer, uh, whomever. Um, and, and they're looking for, uh, again, the, the, the components that present the highest risk of impacts or impairment to the environment. And, uh, in, and in a very modular sense, every time that they identify one of those components, they'll scope it into their inspection. So it's, it's I mean, the shortest answer is it's based on risk. Okay. Next question, two here. 
Uh, <coughs> Linda, back to your slide, the talking about sewage biosolid products that are fer have fertilizer labels. Because really, there's in this pilot program, why wouldn't you include just because the product has got a fertilizer label, if it's causing a lot of issues, can it be included in this program? Yeah, and sorry, that is probably the one thing I should have added. So it is included, um, very much so, in, in our, our pilot approach. So the, um, the one component Nathan mentioned with our new um, uh, pilot inspection is fields, fields receiving anything. And absolutely, commercial fertilizer products, um, whether they're you know a, a, a traditional inorganic fertilizer or a, a um, commercial um, fertilizer that's a waste-derived uh, material would be something that we'll be encouraging our environmental officers to look at. Now, in the case of a commercial fertilizer product, depending on where it's being land applied, the, the land application standards under the Nutrient Management Act that may apply to it may be quite limited. Um, or, or in some cases, there aren't any land application standards under the Nutrient Management Act that will apply. But anything that's land applied to a field, of course, is subject to um, our, our restrictions on causing adverse effects and impairing water. So if uh, one of our officers is out and has concerns that a, a commercial fertilizer product is being land applied in a manner that is, for instance, putting a surface water feature at risk, um, then that would be something that we would uh, expect them to address. And in fairness, they would already be addressing that. It, it's not like we're, this is, this is a brand new world out there. If, if one of our field officers is out and they see something that really alarms them, they'd already be flagging it. But with the, the new inspection program, we're just building it a bit more um, deliberately uh, into the inspection um, approach that we're taking. And just a, just a comment, because there are some companies that are make have fertilizer labels for products that have no complaints so I'm, I'm opposed to it all being lumped together because it appeared I, in your slide that they're all being lumped together I apologize so, that yeah. that would not be my intent it is a trend we're seeing um, of, of more complaints associated with with products I, I'm definitely not uh, intending to identify any particular product okay these uh, dried uh, sewage solids they're touted as being uh, pathogen free because they've been heated and dried is that is that true for a commercial fertilizer product to um, to meet the requirements under um, uh, the fertilizers act and regulation it doesn't have to be um, pathogen free but it has to be very low that's the requirement under that legislation I don't want to speak to the any exact numbers because I it's not our legislation I don't remember it but but that is among the requirements is that it um, uh, be a material with a very low pathogen. So one of the field sketch issues you see a fair bit according to the slides there was slope. And I'm wondering, does the ministry have some standard rule that they use for calculating the slope? In the Nutrient Management Act, it says the word sustained slope. To me, that means if you have 150 feet of slope and you have one little section that's really steep, but it's sustained slope, it's the average over that 150 feet. Does the ministry have a standard that that's how they apply it, or do they look at that short little peak part and call that the slope? My memory is uh, that the definition talks about, and I'm looking at, oh, good, I'm looking at Trevor to this. Just a minute. On. Yeah, it's a maximum sustained slope. It's got to be... Uh, Does it say 10 meters? Yeah, over 10 meters. Okay. Yeah, Trevor is noting in the nutrient management protocol, uh, okay. there's additional information on how to c calculate slope. Okay. And so it's a if you look over the definition combined with the information in the protocol, you'll see it oh, okay. talks about slope over a minimum of 10 meters. And it's also slope within 150 meters. So of that's the a minimum water. of 10 meters, but does that mean that's what you're supposed to use? Any 10 meter zone, you take the slope in that. Just a minute, just a minute, Trevor. <laughs> so you have your 150 meter swath, right? And in that, there are chunks of 10 meter increments. And the highest slope in a 10 meter chunk in there is your maximum sustained slope. The rest of it is not steep. That almost seems unfair because that so restricts the application on that field. Yeah. Right. I mean, the 
farmer can lose the entire field because there's a little 10 meter section where it happens to be a drop off. I suspect you have to put the maximum slope on the sketch, but only the areas that actually have, say, over 12%, which would eliminate that area, say, on a NASM plan, those would be the only ones that would be eliminated. All the other lower yeah. slope area in that 150 meters, you could still land apply on. Yeah. So when you're defining your application area, you should be excluding areas that are within 150 meters that have a slope in excess of 12%. Yeah, I, I realize that, but let's say, for instance, when you're using the software and it asks you for maximum sustained slope, if you put in 7% and the sloped area out of that whole field, it's say, let's say it is a 150 meter sloped area, and out of that you've got a little 6% slope, and the rest of it is 2%, it applies to the entire field when you're entering the data in the software. And so you lose the entire field for a little wee section that will never impact the water. For our folks on the phone, there is much excited discussion going on <laughs> back and forth. about streamlining nutrient management uh, guidelines and all this, I think the other thing that we should look at is what really is a risk? Is that really a risk, that little 10 meter section in a 100 acre field, w when it really will never impact, you, you, you know, the surface water? I realize that we can do and, you know, take a little chunk out of that field and make it a separate field. But that's very hard to identify on the field sketch for getting measurements and making sure you... Like, I, I ju I'm just suggesting, I think that's something that the ministry should look at when they're looking at modifications to the next agri-suite uh, update, or whatever you want to call it. That's, that's my take, anyway. We will take that forward. Uh, just to be clear, the Nutrient Management Act is jointly administered by uh, both <laughs> our ministers. <laughs> it's their fault. Yeah. The thing is, is the, the inspections are done by the That's MECP, right. so, right. so, so you always get flagged as the bad guy. And we love when that happens. But no, and, and uh, as you know, I think it's, it's known right now, the, uh, the government is looking at, at possible options and, and ways to reduce burden, so we'll, we'll certainly uh, that's one of the reasons we like coming out uh, to these kind of functions as a chance to hear from you and, and uh, bring back messages you're giving. 